My name's Sean Schimmel, and I've been playing King Kai, Goku, and upcoming Goku Black. Uh, and King Kai and Goku I've been playing for the last 18 going on 19 years. Playing Goku has been uh, kind of one note in the sense that, you know, on the one hand, you know, every actor, I think, uh, one of the reasons we love acting is because, you know, you get to play a character and watch them grow. But Goku's unique in the sense that, you know, he's a, a Saiyan from another planet who's been hit on the head. He fundamentally stays in the beginner's mind. In fact, you know, as I've studied the character, it's been uh, presented to me by various people in the know that Goku, loosely translated, means master of knowing nothing. And I think, it, to me, it's a Zen parable for the beginner's mind. So he has to stay in this childlike state, which means I don't get the enjoyment of watching him have a, a story arc similar to, say, Piccolo, or in particular, Vegeta, who has obviously grown and changed a lot over the last uh, X hundred episodes we've done or whatever. So it's, it's difficult as an actor, but I, I love the character still, and I love playing that character juxtaposed to uh, the characters that are growing and changing around uh, Goku. So it's pretty cool. While Goku does not grow and change too much uh, as a, his spirit, he's always in this kind of beginner, innocent state, he, I love the idea of him like grappling with the cell phone, uh, his chi being messed up and teleporting in the wrong place, him dealing with you know, other facets of life, him trying to avoid having to do anything other than fight. He's harvesting, what, cabbages or something in the beginning, you know? And he's got a tractor, you know? And then uh, I think my favorite, one of my friends, Vegeta's doing what? Like the Kool-Aid, I call it the Kool-Aid moment. I love, love that. I also love how the whole crew has grown and changed also, you know? Piccolo's babysitting, Krillin's a cop. You know, it's like, where are they now? They're in this show doing other stuff. Now they're all back together. I mean, it's a great, it's a really feel good, uh, feel good show. I know they're ahead in Japan on uh, Dragon Ball Super, and a lot of fans have asked me if I watched ahead. I actually haven't watched ahead that far, although because of my Twitter feed and people I bump into in the world, I get little tidbits here and there. And I will look ahead sometimes for certain special scenes. There's a couple of reasons I do that. I was so comfortable not knowing ahead on Z when we recorded it that it's just, and I'm so used to that even on other shows I do in LA or whatnot, unless I've got a, a prelay show and I know all the episodes, generally even on other dubs I do, I don't know ahead. So I'm so comfortable with it. I, I haven't looked ahead that far, but I, I've, I've needed to for Goku Black because when we first did uh, the first recordings up for the game, the uh, character development was not uh, available to us from Japan, and so I had to kind of wing it. Now that I understand uh, everything that's going on, uh, I've made some modifications to the voice, uh, you know, uh, with the help of our director and, and, and approval from uh, our producer, make sure it's, you know, in that line. People ask me if I, you know, get excited or, or, or anticipate, you know, voicing Goku Black, and I, I spent a lot of time thought about it because as an actor, you want to gl glean as much information as you can to uh, prepare for the character. And this is a particularly confusing character to play because we had to get clear on a causal loop in the timeline, and we also had to figure out, you know, how much should I change, if at all, the voice, because I look at voice acting from a number of, of angles. One angle is just the voice box. It's coming out of Goku's body, so it's gonna sound Goku-like, but I didn't do that for the, for the video game because we weren't aware what was happening. Now that I know, it's gotta sound like Goku, but somebody else inside. And from the work we've done thus far, um, we're noticing that, you know, we'll be recording Goku Black, and then we'll, and I've already recorded Goku, and then when we play it back, it definitely is like, whoa, that is definitely somebody else inside Goku. And it also creates, uh, to break the fourth wall, the illusion that, uh, and, and some of the characters on the show uh, are confused about who Goku is, you know? So th to that end, we needed to make sure that it at least sounded like Goku to some degree. And in a lot of ways, it sounds very, very different. In a lot of ways, you know, it's coming out of my mouth, so in my throat, so it's, uh, or my voice box, as it were. And so it's, uh, you know, it sounds like, Evil Goku. It's about time, Saiyan. You've been running around making messes for too long, and now I'm going to choke the light from you. There were a lot of things we had to adjust or think about and, and, and things that were surprising to me. At first, when I thought, when I was trying to piece it all together with the little information I had, I thought that it was just 
and uh, Goku, who, by virtue of the fact that they were in a parallel universe, because many of the parallel universes just had opposite versions of what they were in our universe, or parallel or adjacent versions, such as Frost and Frieza, who are both evil, ultimately. But Frost is, you know, I'm a good guy, and a lot of people think he's a good guy, but he's more like a politician, it seemed like. And so I was wondering if it was really Goku, but just maybe he didn't get hit on the head and he's evil. So uh, it's it, it definitely changed my tack on it for, you know, how I was going to you know, approach the character. <laughs> well, you must be Goku. So you're Goku Black. Well, definitely, especially when we get to Goku Black Rosé, I finally get a taste of a little bit what it's like to be Vegeta. A little bit. Although I'm not basing any of the character on Vegeta, just I picture that energy a little bit, but it's really more about this uh, power-hungry megalomaniac who, uh, who thinks he's going to make the world better by purging it of uh, humanity is what it seems like is going on. So I, I remember today we were recording some of the first Goku Black and Goku Black Rosé stuff, and I was like, I told uh, Raleigh, I was like, oh, wow, that feels good to finally get to have another emotion other than, I'm happy, everything's great, it's going to be fine, I love ice cream or whatever Goku's, <laughs> you know, thinking about that day. Trunks down there tells me you're strong. Why don't you show me? Hm. That would be an honor. Truth be known, Goku, I've often wondered what it would be like to fight against you in this body. It's not that much different uh, compared to, say, recording Goku and King Kai from a technical perspective, other than the fact that with, uh, when I'm doing Goku and King Kai, my vocal stress usually dictates what order I do it in. I can do King Kai pretty much at any vocal stress, but Goku has a limit because he's got to sound cleaner. But well, King Kai, I'm always doing, so it doesn't matter, you know, how how messed up my voice is usually to do King Kai, but if my voice is messed up, I can't do uh, I can't do Goku at the end of the day. But with Goku and Goku Black, I still do Goku Black second because I'm grounded in Goku, used to playing Goku, and we're still working with and developing, we're growing this voice, and so there's a, it's a little bit of a slower process, a lot of double and tri triple checking with the with the director, uh, getting approval from uh, Justin Cook, our producer, and, 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 and Chris Sabat and Raleigh. We all try to collaborate together to make sure that we, we everybody agrees on this, that we're, we're you know doing a good job. And then once I settle into it, I don't know if it'll be back, be around long enough for me to really settle into it like I have with Goku for 18 years. But once I settle into it, then it would still be technically pr probably Goku first, then Goku Black, then King Kai in that order usually, depending on you know if my voice holds up or whatnot. Raleigh Pickens is, uh, I think, one of the uh, unsung heroes of, of Dragon Ball Super. Because what you have, when you get Raleigh Pickens, is particularly for this show, you get a very seasoned and very fast engineer. But what's even more important is he has almost, because he's doing a lot, he started out directing a lot of the ancillary characters, and now he's kind of taken over a big chunk of the recording, including working with me exclusively. So Raleigh's directing me uh, on almost everything for uh, Dragon Ball Super, and has been since, I think, the, I think Chris directed me and we got set up for Super in the first few episodes and then Raleigh took over especially working with me on Goku Black and so he has almost an encyclopedic knowledge of the show much like a hardcore Dragon Ball fan would have and so he's able to catch things I might not catch or you know compare or listen or feel the vibe or you know he he's just really uh you know if I miss it he's gonna catch it for those of you guys who like the which way the, the show's going Raleigh is uh kind of the the secret mastermind in a way behind uh, the direction of the show uh, in terms of the acting and, and and keeping it all cohesive, especially when it comes to canon. We want to respect the original Japanese, and, and there's a reason for that. Actually, I want to expound on that a little bit, because you know a lot of people like Original Z, and Original Z is great, and, and Funimation was taking a different approach and a different tack at that point. And uh, we've gone more pure since Kai, and even pure for Super. And one of the reasons I feel so strongly about that is because regardless of which language you speak, if Dragon Ball is so popular in Japan, and so the number one thing in Japan practically, if not the number one thing, there must be something that's resonating in emotionally with the Japanese people. Now, short of a few things that don't translate well, such as like humor sometimes doesn't, we have a different, you know, taste in humor, the spirit of the show and the meaning behind the characters, I firmly believe that if represented accurately to the Japanese is gonna be more powerful than original Z that we did, but it's gonna be closer to the Kai and closer to Super, and I think that is really the, the secret power of Super is Akira Toriyama's storytelling, and, and I think it's so uh, critical and important to, uh, to keep that consistent and, and as accurate to the Japanese as absolutely possible, which I believe is what we're doing.
when, when it comes to different arcs that you might see in Dragon Ball Z. So as far as strategies go, when you, you see different arcs, you know, you got your, your Cell Saga, your, your Boo Saga, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see that as clearly defined in Dragon Ball Super right away. Because you have the return of Frieza, then you you know you have a retelling of Battle of Gods and Resurrection now, from different angles and slightly different things. The party is now on a boat and then before it was on land, you know, stuff like that. Vegeta goes on vacation, which is awesome. Right now, I think we're starting, once we get through a bunch of hullabaloo, now we're starting to get into some arcs. We get this tournament, we get Zeno's tournament, now we're getting to the multi-universe tournament. I can't even imagine what would happen after, you know, you've got, uh, you've got this multi-universe tournament. So so whenever, whatever happens with that, whatever universe is left, what do you do after that? A new villain shows up, peace and prosperity? I don't know what they're gonna do. I, I love the whole cast, and every, you know, everyone has their, their favorite uh, voices. I love the voice of Zeno so much, I was joking with Raleigh, I was like, I'm gonna put it in my writer in my contract that I have to record after her because it's so entertaining. And the, the, the beautiful relationship between Zeno and Goku, I mean, I totally get it now. And, and, and people around aren't seeing it. Zeno, as far as I interpret it, you know, spirit, as fundamental, playful child, is exactly like Goku. Zeno's like, oh, you're like me. Yeah, I'm like you. Hey, can we be friends? Yeah, let's be friends. Here's a button, you can call me anytime. Like, they, that, and everybody's fainting and freaking out that if Goku says the wrong thing, Goku's like, ah, don't worry about it. You won't blow up the whole universe. And I'm, and I'm confident in that moment that there's, even if Goku screws up in front of everybody else, that there's nothing he can do to have Zeno destroy Goku's universe or Goku because Goku is Zeno's new BFF. <laughs> I can't tell you in any number of words what a life-changing and exciting journey it's been for all of you guys watching this to be on this ship with me and the, and the whole Dragon Ball crew here for our English-speaking dub. I consider it a, uh, a lifelong privilege to have been the guy who got to play such a beloved character, and I, I, I hope I did it right, and uh, I, I, if I didn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, uh, it's been my personal honor to have all of you on board, and I look forward to many adventures on the nimbus cloud of Dragon Ball Super and beyond, as it were. And so thank you so much for watching, and uh, I hope to see you guys out in the real world uh, sometime soon. So thank you. Thank you.